Uh, I would like to start with the acknowledgement of the country. I'm, I'm joining remotely from the land of the Wurundjeri people of Kulin Nation in the University of Sydney. We are in the land of the Gadigal people of Eora Nation. And I would, I would like to also emphasize and extend it globally wherever you are joining, especially at the time that these issues are very important for us. So uh, without further ado, I would like to start uh, introducing our first uh, uh, presenter, Dr. Eleni Papadoni-Kolaki Papadoni from uh, Delft University of Technology. And she's talking about uh, psychologically safe, uh, digitally enabled project uh, teams. Eleni, back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. I'm very pleased to be part of this um, symposium, and I, I also enjoyed the conversations just now about AI. And um, so my presentation, uh, it's a bit on a, on a similar topic, again, looking at uh, digitally enabled project teams, but more from um, the side of, of leadership, how do we lead these teams, especially since um, digitalization is impacting the psychological, psychological safety of uh, the members. I've worked on this uh, with my colleague, Beth Morgan, who couldn't join us today. And uh, it's also an ongoing study. So I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts as well. Um, the motivation was uh, a lot of research that's around uh, how digitalization is impacting uh, people and project work. We know that there are some discussions about how the, the digital, it's not just um, it's not just the end goal, but it's also something that is uh, affecting the way that people interact, teams are managed, and how project managers, they are uh, developing their uh, delivering uh, projects as well. And so amongst these uh, chains and these uh, shifts that take place in project teams, we, we were very interested to see, to see about psychological safety and dive deeper into how the teams react to all these changes we just mentioned. Um, so just to um, just to uh, talk a bit about psychological safety, I'm, I'm sure so many of you have already heard these terms before. They come from um, uh, some decades ago, and the idea is that when we have a psychologically safe team, then the team members, they're more keen to take risks, to and to grow, to experiment with new technologies. And this can uh, affect also growth, learning and innovation in the teams itself. So it's um, we established from previous studies that it's worth adding a bit more light, especially on psychological safety of project teams that undergo digitalization. Um, therefore, we sought out to, to answer the question how the leader's behavior can establish psychological safety in project teams that are impacted by digital transformation. And um, as I mentioned, this is an ongoing study. Um, we focused a lot on qualitative methodology and um, the setting was the built environment construction sector. We interviewed so far 14 industry experts, and we have already seen some saturation in the data that I'll present in the next slide. Uh, the people that we interviewed, they were people that had two, left, two feet on these uh, two different topics. So one had to do with the digitalization aspect, and the other had to do with um, uh, leadership, but also looking at health and safety in projects. Some of them were um, global health leaders. So they were people who uh, were familiar with both the psychological safety topic, but also the digital transformation that it's um, undergoing in projects. And we are also looking at both junior and senior people. So most of them were leading their teams, but also we tried to get a more holistic representation of the sample by looking at people who are more of the junior side. And uh, our next step after we finish analyzing this data would be to go into a focus group and um, try to test some of these ideas, but also co-create some uh, solutions and recommendations with uh, experts. 
so moving on, that's uh, my last slide. Uh, these are the preliminary findings. And you can see some uh, first, second uh, order coding, uh, as well as some uh, clusters of themes that have emerged. Um, so what we uh, what we ended up from the first analysis that we did was essentially the role of leadership and how it's changing and it has different uh, impact areas, if you like, uh, in order to support uh, innovative and very collaborative project teams. One had to do with a more strategic positioning of the team within the parent company and the client regarding risks and costs and rewards, especially as concerns uh, technology and uh, implementation of the technology and how this is changing workflows and the workspace. And the other side was more at the um, individual and organizational level, if you like, with regards to how the team is organized and self-organized in order to create uh, value uh, through this um, innovative way of working. Uh, so we ended up uh, looking at these two um, aspects, but also some emerging findings had to do with uh, different patterns on, on the impact of psychological safety on, on people. So we either had people who were more reluctant, let's say, to, to take over the risk and uh, so psychological safety was uh, um, poor, poorer, if you like, but we also had uh, individuals who were more keen to take the risk. So the, these types of individuals and the context of their teams, it's also interesting to look further. And just a, a, a final comment, um, as emerging finding COVID-19 pandemic and the impact of that came a lot, uh, um, emerged a lot, came a lot in our discussions with the interviewees, although we were not specifically talking to them or asking them about uh, this, um, this challenge. And uh, we weren't asking them especially about remote work through teams and so on, but this was something that emerged in a lot of interviews. So I think uh, it's it's worth a bit to to look more about how um, the after effects of this pandemic also has have impacted project work. And um, yeah, thank you very much for your attention. And um, yeah, happy to discuss with you. Thanks, Eleni. Uh, uh, so so our presenters would stay here, and uh, we would have. Uh, 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 a lot of time for, for discussions. Please post your question on the Q&A. I can see uh, questions are starting to uh, to come up. Uh, so I would uh, hand it over to Jens uh, Hunhevic uh, from, uh, uh, from ETH Zurich. He's representing his team and he's presenting a different technology which uh, when we saw the discussions were going about technologies and, and the cycle of the technologies, we can see that this technology has had also its cycle and he's presenting interesting uh, implications of, of, uh, uh, of the crypto comments. Uh, so the floor is yours, Jens. All right, hello from Switzerland to everyone. I'll present our work on decentralized project delivery on the crypto comments. As said, it's around it's about blockchain, a uh, technology that had a bit its hype cycle, but we still think there's a lot of interesting um, implication to project delivery. So let's dive into it. See if I can control the slides. All right. So the main question or main motivation we had is can we further decentralize project delivery? And why is this question relevant? We think construction was described repeatedly as a complex system. Um, if you look at this picture, even if you're not from construction, you can see um, there is a lot of interdependencies from different stakeholders, project teams. You're dependent on external factors like weather and traffic. So you have a lot of nonlinear and uncertain uh, uh, system dynamics in a construction project. And for complex systems, decentralized bottom-up coordination or self-organization is suggested to be the main governance system. And this insight comes from studies from nature, like these and ants, but also from man-made systems like traffic control or wind turbine optimization, where these approaches actually prove to be very successful. And interesting is also that 
project delivery, collaborative project deliveries like IPD that start to use more decentralized approaches like shared stewardship of project resources, they're actually very successful. So our question is, can we go further along these lines and more decentralized, more project delivery? And of course, we look towards technology um, as a means to achieve this. And the main technology we are looking into is blockchain. So I want to bring you now the, the concepts a bit closer, why we think this is the case. So the first concept you need to understand is common pool resource theory. A common pool resource is a resource that is open to all. So everyone can go and use this resource. And what usually happens is the tragedy of the commons. For example, in pastures where everyone can bring their cows to graze, you want to write the benefits to yourself and you deplete the resource over time. Now, one suited governance system for that is bottom-up coordination. And Eleanor Ostrom introduced eight Ostrom principles that she found through case study research, how these crypto, uh, how these common pool resource scenarios can, can be managed. The interesting connection with construction is that also IPD or a com a like collaborative project delivery resembles some of these Ostrom principles in their governance structure. One example is that they pool together resources and put a, a alliance contracts for shared risk rewards um, in, in place. So participants in, are incentivized for to more collaborate during the time of the project instead of using as many resources as they can for themselves. So the connection with blockchain that is interesting is that also blockchain can be seen as a common pool resource scenario. Um, they share similarities with free and open source software like Wikipedia, where you also have a lot of free rider problems. For example, everyone wants to read the, the articles, but no one wants to write them. And blockchains are very expensive systems to put in place. They need to run a lot of computers and you need to participate in consensus algorithms to add new transactions to the system so the overall system works. And the interesting thing is how blockchain solves this free rider problem or this uh, common pool tragedy of the commons problem. And it's all about crypto economics. So now we need to dive a bit into what blockchain can do. And I don't have time to go into too much detail. But two main concepts are smart contracts, which can encode logic, how to interact with transactions. And you can code new tokens, which are basically you can create money. So you can create value containers and give them certain features. And blockchain use this to incentivize contribution to the public good. And this is called the crypto commons. So if you behave with the system and you contribute, you earn cryptocurrency and you uh, are incentivized to, to, to actually contribute. So the idea is to use these mechanisms also for other uh, cases and in our case, project delivery. So we had to, what, what do we have to do to find out how we can use this for project delivery? And we dove into literature. I mean, you cannot really read this. I, I, um, that's okay. I just give you an, a, an idea what, what this means. So we identified 14 mechanisms in line with these Ostrom principles that blockchain can do, and then identified applications to project delivery. So one key concept, for example, is identity. So you need to be able to identify participants, are they human or machine, uh, in the system so you can actually track what they're doing. Um, one other concept, for example, is the tokenization of resources. So you can create resource pools through tokenization. Uh, it can be money, it can be time, it could be also physical resource representation. And with both these features in place, you can have very transparent monitoring of and, and uh, fast reactions to what's happening in the system, something that is really important for self-organization or bottom-up coordination. And blockchain is a very transparent system. Everyone can see these transactions. So it's a very well-suited uh, system for that. And finally, you can then create a lot of coordination mechanisms that interact with these other features. So you can say who can access the project resources under what conditions, um, who can do, who can participate, and how in the decision making, like sanctions if you don't participate as one as needed in the project, 
or also dispute resolution mechanisms. And a lot of these features were already proposed by research from different uh, individual research um, efforts. And what we did, we basically created this overarching uh, conceptualization and system perspective, how they could work together to create a new system. And it, this can scale from like individual applications of blockchain, for example, for tendering, um, towards whole decentralized systems. And then you have a lot of these interactions between different applications. So overall, what we propose is a new system perspective um, using this technology to scale um, project delivery as, as a common pool resource scenario. And it potentially is an alternative vision how to scale project delivery, how to adapt to more complex systems or complex projects instead of going the opposite direction, which we also see a lot today, trying to simplify the system, the supply chain and integrate the supply chain. So it's a, in our opinion, a different vision how to go about the future of project delivery. I leave it here. Thank you for your attention. And I'm sure we can have, and uh, we can discuss questions. These are the resources that are published for now, if you're interested to read more. Thank you. Thanks, Jens. Uh, I just want to emphasize, if there is any question, please, I can see the questions are coming, but please don't hesitate to post it there. I can see some of our presenters actively are engaging with the question, but we would also have time at the end uh, to discuss them. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to introduce our next presenter from uh, from home, from Sydney. Uh, so Ken is presenting his team uh, 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 and he's talking about uh, community stakeholder engagement on, on uh, social media. Ken, without further ado, it's, uh, the floor Thank is yours. You. Thank you, Nader. And uh, greetings, everyone from all across the different continents. So my topic is on response strategies for community engagement, uh, stakeholder engagement on social media. Uh, this is work that I'm doing together with uh, Professor Pernelle Eskrod and uh, Associate Professor Anna uh, Lund Jepsen, as well as Ivy, um, Ivy Tang, who um, is, is in the audience, and she's my PhD student. And this research is also funded by the uh, Project Management Institute uh, grant. Um, so we began our original research question with uh, with this, how do projects engage stakeholders on social media? And the idea was that, you know, when we looked at the uh, preliminary data, what we found was that actually on social media, it's actually very difficult to identify um, who the actual stakeholders are, although they might be active, we don't have much information about actually who's behind those accounts, be it on Twitter or be it on, um, be it on Facebook. Uh, we may have uh, for the more prominent uh, leaders like news media or political leaders and so on, but not for every community stakeholder. And so that posed a challenge. So when we talk about traditional uh, project stakeholder analysis in the offline world, we are presented with the um, framework from Escarot on identification, assessment, and prioritization. And this is not new at all. So identification is really about identifying who can be affected or who is affected by the project. And um, assessment is about understanding the motivations of every stakeholder, uh, using that information to understand where they can contribute, how much they can contribute, and so on. And prioritization is really about focusing on the most urgent stakeholders, or in the words of Mitchell and colleagues, on the most definitive stakeholders who have urgency, legitimacy, and power as well. So we found that this was actually slightly problematic and very challenging um, in the online world. It's not necessarily quite easy to do this. And so we uh, adjusted our question and, and the question became, what refinements or adjustments to project uh, assessment and response strategies are advisable if the project aspires to engage community stakeholders via social media? And it's also very timely uh, that uh, for the purpose of um, you know, finding an answer to this question, we contextualized it within the domain of uh, the Western Sydney International Airport, uh, which is the second uh, international airport being built in Sydney here in Australia. It's due for completion in 2026. 
And this has been um, on and on uh, with the community and the government, local, federal uh, levels uh, since the 1990s. So it's been a long time coming. And um, it's finally coming to fruition. And it's very, very exciting to be um, right at the heart of this uh, construction project, uh, because we also believe that this is part of history, uh, particularly in Australia. Um, we looked at a number of themes that were ongoing in the social uh, media space, and we found that uh, there were things about land issues. There were things, uh, there were chatter about uh, flight paths, the naming of the airport. But the, the two themes or the two embedded cases that we found most prominent for us was the Experience Center, which is a physical center that um, showcased the airport and showcased the construction of the site. And the other theme was uh, local employment. And these got the most uh, user engagement in the online space with the project responding to it as well. And the platform of choice was Facebook purely because of the accessibility of the data, as well as the fact that uh, there was a lot of engagement between stakeholders and the project as well. And so our unit of analysis was all the posts, the replies that were made, the emoticons that were tagged to the post and so on. And um, the framework for our analysis, we, we looked at a couple of things. Number one, we looked at uh, whether the, the comments from stakeholders were they positive, neutral, or negative towards the project. We also looked at the emotions they expressed, a so capitalization of words, um, emoticons such as anger and happy faces that were tagged onto messages and so on. The next thing we also looked at was um, the um, Johnston and Taylor's uh, framework for stakeholder uh, engagement, uh, which was classified as high, middle, or low. Low is simply if you're liking a post and high if you're really, you know, colluding together to, to uh, basically oppose the project and there's some impact happening like a striker or something. And finally, uh, using alternate and synonyms framework on response strategies, um, we also use that to understand, um, um, you know, what the response from the project was. So the findings that we found uh, was that number one, there was a high to medium level of engagement from the stakeholders. Now, these were obviously, they were opposing or neutral. At the same time, there were ones that were supporting as well. And so with the ones that were uh, opposing, a lot of people criticized about the project process and outcomes and the side effects as well. And the ones who supported were, were very happy, for example, positive about employment opportunities and so on. What we found from the project response uh, perspective was that there was often no response or no reaction or no acknowledgement uh, to these stakeholder comments. And in terms of the strategy, it was generally mostly dismissal, which is ignoring the messages, or avoidance, which is basically you know, pointing the finger to someone else uh, to answer difficult questions like flight paths and so on. And so um, to conclude it all, what we're proposing is that um, as an adjustment for the social media context, because it's uh, fairly difficult to identify stakeholders, our attention is better focused on identifying those issues or the concern and so on. And from this case study, we say that, you know, when you identify those prominent issues, you can then also highlight those stakeholders who generally are very active about those issues. Once you have that, you can then categorize the issues and then you can start prioritizing them. And finally, um, the acknowledgement of positive responses, encouraging that's important, as well as acknowledging their, their issues or their, their concerns or fears that they have, that's equally important as well. And having that kind of, um, response ready to be deployed, particularly for issues that are very, uh, very prominent um, at any point in time. So this uh, particular article is published in August in the International Journal of Project Management. Um, and I think um, Eli has finally posted it up on, on the chat uh, for us. So please do have a read and you know we can have more views in the article. So I really appreciate that. Uh, so with that, I, uh, Nada, I will, I will conclude my, my brief uh, talk here and I'll hand over to the next person. I'll hand back to you, Nada. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ken. A uh, very interesting discussion, uh, similar to, to our previous uh, presenters. So 
Uh, I would just, uh, uh, I wouldn't waste uh, time and I would ha hand it over to Xin Yu, uh, who is from uh, Tongji University and she's presenting an international team. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm very interested in the, in the depth of the data that you have, uh, you have uh, collected. Uh, so she's talking about the transition to operation in large uh, inter-organizational projects. So uh, looking forward to you and the floor is yours. Thank you, Nada. Um, hi, nice to meet you. We am Xinyue Zhang, and I'm very delighted to be here to share our latest um, paper titled Designing the Transition to Operations in Large Interorganizational Projects, Strategy, Structure, Process, and People, published in the Journal of Operations Management. And we know large infrastructure systems can be divided into two categories, projects and operations. The activities and objectives of the project and the operations are inherently different. And due to the unique and one-time nature of projects, their organizational forms tend to be more temporary, goal-oriented and evolving. In contrast, operations are more repetitive, and their organizational forms are more permanent, routine, and ongoing. Transition is where the two worlds of projects and operations collide, and where the two forms of organization coexist. Managers face significant challenges to reconcile the tensions between organizations with distinct logics, build versus use, and effectively manage the transition of the infrastructure asset from projects to operations. So we have the research question, how to organize the transition to operations in large inter-organizational projects? In the paper, we provided a comprehensive summary of the literature on projects, transitions, and operations covering their organizational design aspects in terms of strategy, structure, process, and people. In this study, we conducted a longitudinal case study of Beijing Daxing International Airport, and it's the largest transportation hub to, in China to date. And our paper presents the organizational structure of Daxing Airport throughout its planning, construction, transition, and operational phases. Uh, offering valuable insights into how large projects are organized in China today. In the data collection, we conducted a 17 months participant observation. We have two rounds of interviews and we have collected a substantial amount of data. We use JAL method to analyze the data. In the findings, we developed an organizational de design framework for transitioning large into organizational projects to operations. We found that building connections and achieving continuity between projects and operations is the essence of organizational design strategies for large project transitions. And internalizing project and operational functions within the owner is a key approach to realize this objective. These strategies are achieved through relevant organizational design considerations regarding structure, process, and people. In terms of structure, we emphasize the evolution of organizational structures related to system integration. We emphasize forming ad hoc integrated organizations to address the complexity of the system. And in terms of process, we emphasize process extension and coordination mechanisms so that the project and operations systems overlap and promotes a smoother transition. In terms of people, we emphasize the concurrent leadership and job rotation between temporary organizations and permanent organizations. Temporary organizations here, for example, project management organizations, project delivery team, and permanent organizations, for example, government, owner, and operations management organizations. 
For practitioners, this framework can provide a holistic guide for future organizational design of large project transitions. And these findings can also be considered as optional organizational design building blocks. And in discussion, we have some interesting observations. We have some insights into the strong owner concept. And we have some insights into process mechanisms. Here, somebody may, may know Jennifer White made an insightful analogy of transition between projects and operations as passing the baton, emphasizing the coordination of the transition process. We further suggest the analogy of a three-legged race to frame the transition to operations of Dashing Airport as requirements from project and operations should be considered together throughout the life cycle. And we have some interesting discussion of the concurrent and the rotational roles. And we talk about the contingency issues. We discuss the possibilities and the limitations of generalizing our findings to other types of projects and different institutional contexts. And finally, to take away, the transition should be designed to achieve continuity between projects and operations, emphasizing coordination, information exchange, and re reconciling temporary and permanent organizational forms, ad hoc integrated organizations should be designed to manage transitions, emphasizing concurrent leadership and job rotation in temporary and permanent organizations. That's all my presentation. And welcome to download and read our paper. And finally, I, by the way, this is my first invitation to give a talk. So I'm very, very excited. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you all. Thank you, Nada. <laughs> Thanks, Xinyu. Great uh, to hear about your work. Uh, so now we have our, all of our, our uh, presenters, except uh, Eleni, who excused uh, because she had another engagement to leave uh, to answer your questions. I saw that uh, before going to the questions, I just want to also uh, uh, point that you can see the questions that have been answered and Ele Eleni had very interesting discussions about the methodology and how they have collected the data and how uh, uh, this data has has differentiated between the, for example, impact on digit uh, digitization and the underlying uh, impacts on the project itself. So you can you can read those discussions there. But uh, for the presenters who are here, I would go first to Jens. And uh, there is a very general question by Jean Laval Chou, which is about, uh, is cri uh, crypto a major enough technology for project management use? I'm sure you have a lot to say about that, even though it's not a specifically about your presentation. Yes, I think it's one of the most relevant questions. And the answer is it depends, of course, right? So I don't know how much time we have to go into the details here, but I think certain applications are quite mature. I mean, the question is, are, they, are these the relevant applications for project delivery? So I think more simple use of blockchain for use of cryptocurrency, for example, maybe some simple, more simple smart contract logic, I think could be applied. Um, Oh, but in general, I think there is still a long way to go for the technology. We are very early stage still. The technology is very young. It's way younger than AI. And I, also there, we, we are uh, still at the beginning, as we heard in the, in the introduction panel session. So uh, I, I do think there is a lot to come. Um, these technologies will improve. They will get cheaper. They will get more reliable. Um, but I do think... Yeah, to some extent, certain early applications could be also tested and implemented. But yeah, we need more research. That's why why I'm doing this. <laughs> Thanks, Jens. Uh, I go back. I go next for the next question. I go to you, Ken. And there is a question about if if there was any fun finding regarding the effectiveness and uh, uh, best practice methodologies for each of the social media platforms. Uh, yeah, thanks, Nader. Um, yes, so thank you for the question as well. Um, 
in in this particular study that we did, we actually um, firstly looked at a number of platforms. I think uh, obviously one of them was was Twitter, and we also looked at Instagram. Uh, we also looked at LinkedIn. Uh, I mean, all these different platforms have slightly different purposes, if you like. Uh, but the thing was, we focused more on Facebook purely because of the uh, the richness and the quantity of the uh, exchanges that happened um, in these platforms. And unfortunately, we were not able to um, do a cross-platform analysis. Our focus was more on the engagement part between stakeholders themselves and the the community stakeholders and the and the project. And so I think that is probably one of the limitations of the study and um, that I think has been touched on as well uh, to compare different, um, you know, social media platforms. Uh, but having said that, you know, what we have proposed um, in, in the conclusion is that um, the strategy that projects uh, we believe should be adopting um, is obviously not going to be tied to a specific social media platform. As you can see, the strategy that's being provided is uh, fairly generic um, and it's not uh, specific to any particular platforms. And as we know, with technology, they are, you know, um, always changing as well, how Twitter has now become X and um, there's, uh, I think, Blue Sky that's, that's, that's coming out as well uh, by the original Twitter founder. So uh, hopefully that, that answers uh, a question. Hopefully a future study would, uh, would uh, do that and we can then advise, yep, for, for X, this is the sort of strategy you should be using for Instagram uh, users, this is the, the the engagement strategy you should be using. I can I can definitely say um, I'm learning a lot from my uh, teenagers in terms of uh, um, how to engage on social media because they are on a totally different platform. They're on Snapchat and so on. Yeah. Thanks, Ken. Just before going to Shinyu, I just want to have a follow up, maybe conversation. Do you think in future we would have uh, an opportunity to connect these characteristics and strategies to? certain type of algorithm behind these platforms? Yeah, uh, so for yeah, Nader, actually, this is a great segue as well from the previous uh, talk on AI that we've just had. I mean, you can imagine, you know, um, if we can train, um, you know, the technology to be able to respond uh, based on <clears throat> the patterns that we've had in the past before, or on the other hand, you could potentially have AI doing the entire analysis for you in terms of what are the current issues um, and, and you know, prioritizing that for you. That's a potential. I mean, that that is definitely possible in my point of view. Um, and I think that's where it might be where it might be heading as well. And we don't know, maybe it could be AI engaging with AI <laughs> on the other hand. So it is a very, um, um, yeah, interesting time i would say yeah thanks ken uh, shinyu i want to come to you there is a question about the assumption of temporary organizing and i just want to see how you want to unpack uh, uh, this assumption and how, how you have faced it in your research yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nada. I, I, <laughs> I know there is a debate in the academy about this the temporary versus permanent. And the, the, we, in, we use the temporary to uh, describe the project. We use a one time, a unique, this such wording. Um, but I know this. And in our paper, we use the wording more temporary, <laughs> no, the temporary. And the, the, that's the first point. And the second, um, actually, in our paper, we have um, discussed the char characteristics of repetitive of projects. Yeah, and because uh, our research object is uh, airports, it's the uh, it's the uh, infrastructure, and such projects, such large infrastructure projects, actually they have the characteristics of repetitive, and uh, and just and uh, because of this kind of repetitive, and the owner. Uh, the owners they have built and uh, operated lots of airports, maybe subways, and so that they can have the in-house project um, capabilities. And so, so uh, 
because of this uh, kind of repetitive and they can um, use their experience and or knowledge from these projects to next projects. Uh, do you know Andrew Davis uh, paper? He talked about the reputation of economics of the projects. Yeah, we talk about that. Thank you. Thanks, Xinyu. Uh, coming back to you, Jens, uh, there is a problematization question, and they, uh, the question is saying, uh, what was the problem with the with the with the way it was done, but uh, with the old-fashioned currency on the project, and uh, and I would I would I would probably focus on that first, and then I would go for the follow-up question. Um. Well, this depends a bit. I think in certain projects it works quite well and there is, seems to be not too much issue around payments. But there is also a lot of literature that mm. um, describes a lot of problems around payments, late payments, uh, insolvency of, of, of firms. I mean, there is, I think there is problems. Um, but I, I think in our work, we don't only focus on what's wrong and how we can solve it with blockchain. I think it goes a bit further than that. It goes a bit towards what can we do new uh, with this technology? And instead of just optimizing the existing processes, for example, how it's done nowadays, we can add an, a lot of new things. For example, instead of having just monetary pools, we can also code new asset classes for example we can tokenize the physical resource and create make a resource pool out of that we can tokenize time and we can make that a resource and you can instead of having just one dimension to optimize the project which is money you suddenly have maybe multiple options and you can also create economic systems uh, around these and the second aspect I want to highlight is the aspect of machine participation, which is very interesting regarding the first um, uh, panel discussion. Blockchain addresses can be controlled also by machines. The system doesn't involve any humans, it's a technical system. So as long as the transaction is valid in terms of the system um, uh, requirements, it's, uh, it can be done. So you can imagine, start imagining AI agents that own address to get rewarded for project contributors. You can contributions like generative design agents, for example, um, or, also, or a lot of other uh, things we talked about. And we also talked about the transparency, right? I think having governance done through blockchain creates a lot of transparency, especially if you start to deal with non-human actors that interact with the economic system of the project. So I think that's actually the more exciting part than just improving the old system a little bit. I think it brings a lot of new things to the table. And these opportunities might also couple with other technologies. This is what I'm hearing from you. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, thanks, Jens. Uh, uh, coming back to you, Ken, uh, there is a question about how do we identify stakeholders who are impacted by the project but are not active in the social media, uh, especially for projects such as uh, uh, Western Sydney Airport, which is a legacy project. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah. Absolutely. I think that's a that's a really really good question and uh, obviously a very uh, valid question as well. Uh, we have, uh, for example, a number of um, uh, different generations, for example, of uh, community stakeholders who may not be active on, on uh, social media, and but they are living in uh, those affected areas, for instance. And therefore, again, <clears throat> this would be just one side of the story in terms of what I've presented in terms of the um, engagement online. Uh, the moment you talk about these stakeholders, uh, our study would have, you know, not much to say because we obviously have not studied them. We only could study the ones who are active on, on Facebook and so on. So I think that's why it's important for this sort of triangulation to occur. And that's why um, not just looking at social media aspects, but uh, you need to also be able to look at um, those um, community stakeholders who are not necessarily engaging online. And this means doing everything, um, you know, uh, within uh, the power of, for example, um, not just um, 
the local governments. But uh, in terms from the project perspective, I think they basically have to reach out to as many avenues as, as possible. One of the things that community stakeholders do not differentiate is it's is the government and us. If it's the if it's a project that's such as, uh, as big as the Western um, Sydney International Airport, um, they wouldn't have necessarily the information that oh, if I have concerns, then I would have to go to um, you know the Western Sydney International Airport website or there's a spokesperson there. They would naturally sometimes directly go to council and so on, and so in terms of identifying these uh, pockets of stakeholders, I think it is important for the project, obviously, to consider reaching out to councils, um, making sure that there's there's good information and awareness that's being spread around, and considering also the cultural and linguistic diverse uh, nature of these stakeholders to make sure, you know, because indeed a, a lot of the residents who live in, in, in Western Sydney uh, for example, in Cumberland Council, uh, which is one of the councils that's affected, it has the highest number of refugees, uh, residents, for example. And so um, ensuring that these <clears throat> um, uh, segments of the stakeholders are also included, I think uh, this is also really, really important. Uh, they've done a really good uh, job, for example, they, they have a flight path tool at the moment, where you can definitely look at where you know the planes will fly over and whether your suburb or your residence would be affected or not. Um, but uh, from from the project perspective, you you will find that they they haven't been really good. For example, in in um, um, making sure that everyone's aware on, about this and bringing them along. And um, a lot of the times, um, in fact, I think. Um, um, Nena, was, I think asked the question is that has advised me that people generally find out things from the news, including people from the council and so on. And so I think, um, uh, yeah, doing as much as possible to, you know, identify these stakeholders at all levels is absolutely crucial. Uh, but it's not the study that I've presented on today. This study hasn't looked at it. Yeah. And and uh, would you? Would you probably add a little bit? So, so if if we are adding more platform, basically we would try to find those those missing spots as well. Mm -hmm. I, I'm assuming, for example, the tool you're mentioning would might and might engage different stakeholders than the Facebook. Yeah, I mean, what we have done is we've just looked at um, uh, Facebook um, at the moment, uh, just because of the sheer amount of um, interactiveness and the engagement and the replies and so on that's available there for us to study. Uh, so uh, we, what we've proposed is um, these are some guiding principles, if you like, um, in terms of response strategies. And because it's challenging to really identify stakeholders online, we found that they are more vocal around certain issues. And from the project perspective, those issues are worth listening to because these are not necessarily found in uh, town hall meetings. They're not necessarily found on the Western Sydney International Airport. Uh, they, have a, they have a regular official forum where council representatives are there, but not necessarily you know, inclusive of community residents, for example. Uh, and so that's quite quite important to to consider that, um, and and yeah, so that's I think how I would um, answer that, Nadi. Thanks, Ken. Mm -hmm. uh, coming to you, Shin. You there is a, the the previous question was about discontinuity and temporary nature, and here we are talking about continuity. So how the project and organization can create continuity in the transition, and specifically they. They are asking if there was examples of these, uh, what was continuous and what changed in the handover in the case study that you had. It's a very good question because in our paper, we always emphasize that we need to uh, establish the continuity and the connections between projects and operations in the transition. And we know in the traditional practice in the transition uh, facilities are handed over project-based organizations leave and the delivery team is disbanded and then operations organizations take over. 
this way create organizational separation and the disconnect between projects and operations. And we have our argument that transition is a phase that unfolds over time, evolving the joining and the living of organizations, people, and the knowledge. So your question, um, what is the continuous? What, uh, how can, can cre create continuity? Uh, in our paper, uh, I think um, maybe from the process and people in terms of process, we emphasized that the, um, the project management organizations uh, extended to the operations phase and the operations management organizations can be extended to the project phase so they can have an overlap and and the and it can create continuity and also the people in our paper we highlighted the concurrent leadership do you know this it means the um, uh, leaders they have both positions in the uh, project management organizations and operations uh, management organizations because it's the same person so uh, he or she can use his capabilities to um, to build this kind of continuity. And as for the what changed in the handover, um, we know the objectives and the actives of the projects and uh, the operations are inherently different. And so, uh, so the organizational structure is, is changed. And um, Actually, I just think the organizational structure is changing and everything can be continued and uh, continued and connected if you use some um, techniques or some considerations in our paper, it can be continued and connected. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Xingyi. So, so, you, so you, you, the main source of, if I understood right, the, you are mentioning that the main source of continuity was through people within the organizations. Actually, the, the strategy, people, structure, process, all these four aspects are continuous and connected in our paper. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, coming back to you, Jens, there is a question about AI. If, uh, is AI wired up to act uh, in good faith, tell the truth, uh, be collaborative? Uh, uh, Within the within the projects, I think it's an interesting question. I think first of all, I'm not an AI expert. I'm just lo uh, loosely following uh, what's going on uh, with AI. I think I can more speak to how I think it connects to the research I do. And I think, in my opinion, especially in project based settings that are like traditional project based settings, collaboration is really important. And AI as a technology is kind of neutral. I don't think there is like any will to collaborate or not. Um, it's depend. It's a bit dependent how we integrate it into our systems. And there, I think the the systems I imagine with blockchain as a baseline for more transparency can really help because, like, you. Connecting AI or forcing AI to interact with these systems gives, gives also some transparency, right? So we can see what are the, the baseline or the decisions we we use from AI and how we how we act on it, right? And the second part uh, that is quite important, I think, is I think it's also about incentives. So I'm not too sure how an AI would react to incentives, but with humans, the, these incentives tend to be quite strong. So you, if you set, set up the incentives inside a project uh, towards collaboration, you have a high likelihood that you also move in that direction. And I do think that could be also true for AI. Um, how that would exactly look like, I'm not sure, but that would be a very interesting uh, new research field too, I think. That can connect to, to your technology as well. Uh, thanks for taking the question, even though it's not directly on your on your on your area. 
Uh, I I come to you, Ken, uh, with a with a quick question. How did you deal with any ethical issues about uh, using the data? Um, yeah, talking about ethics, uh, the um, ethics application was the way for us to do it. Although this was public data, uh, but we still uh, went in and uh, put ahead a uh, an ethical a human ethics application at the university, and uh, we have it approved. Uh, I should also mention that um, Facebook actually has the open research and transparency platform, uh, which allows us to actually use uh, and publish um, the data. Um, so it, it allows that, yeah. Uh, and and that, that has been really, really helpful. Uh, but if, if you talk about the privacy of individuals and so on, we did mention that we were not so interested in what actually the um you know one particular individual said we're more interested in the patterns of the engagement and we're more interested in you know if if they were community members you know talking about things like flight path for instance what was the response strategy like and you know was that negative or positive so we're more looking at these sort of general patterns rather than um, zooming into one particular user group, for example, and that wasn't our our intent in this in this study. Um, and so we've uh, where we had to show examples for for example, obviously we adhere to all the confidentiality and privacy um, um, you know aspects, and we de-identified um, you know the uh, the users and so on. We anonymized it in the uh, presentation of our of, of our data. Um, and um, yeah, so hopefully that answers the, yeah. uh, the question. Th yeah. mm. Thanks a lot. It's a very interesting uh, uh, yeah. way of ethics uh, uh, in, in when we are having also social media. Mm -hmm. uh, and the last question also in the because of the time that we only have three minutes left uh, is to you, Shin Yu, and it is about how do we uh, generalize the the especially the organizational design framework that you would have in other cases of uh, mega projects in other institutional contacts right yeah yeah okay actually this content is extensively discussed in our paper so let me briefly explain uh, globally we know due to the significant impact of the large infrastructure projects most of these projects are financed by the government, right? And so there are certain similarities in organizational configurations. And in China, what's the difference? The majority of participants in infrastructure projects are state-owned enterprises. And all the uh, all participants are under the rule of administration power, right? And the issue of what, what we think the difference is the issue of system integration. In Daxing Airport case, maybe more about allocating resources under administrative power to meet changing tasks. And in contrast to the cases from other institutional contexts, maybe more about coordination of more independent economic entities, right? And to ally uh, of the different in interests. So the mechanism of the integration are different. In China, maybe by administration power and in, different, in other institutional contexts, maybe by the ma uh, market logic. Yeah, that's the answer. Thank you. Thanks, Xinyu, and thanks uh, to all of our presenters, including Eleni, Jens, uh, Ken, and Xinyu for very interesting research and, and also for your interesting answers to the questions that are raised. Also, I would like to thank all the audiences for uh, being engaged in the discussion and asking uh, interesting questions. Again, feel free to reach out to the presenters uh, for following the question.